So uh, today's topic for crossover, I want to welcome anybody on the internet. Thanks for coming and joining us on the internet today. Good to have you here. Uh, pursuing Christ, part one, pursuing Christ is uh, today. Today's verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. So he didn't, he's just saying that all that he talked about in the first chapter about carnal wisdom versus spiritual wisdom. I'm not coming with natural carnal wisdom. I'm not going to speak out of my brain. I'm going to be speaking by revelation, by the Spirit of God. For, verse 2, I know, I determined, I made a dis, uh, deliberate decision not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's interesting, Jesus Christ, it's the only time you find it phrased this way in the Bible, Jesus Christ and him crucified. So him personally and also what he did for me. But I came uh, not, uh, determined not to know. And the word know there is not the typical, usually it's gnosko in the Greek. This is ido. And it has to do with I, not perceiving, not seeing, not, not focusing on. So he said, when I'm among you, I have made it a deliberate decision of mine that what I'm going to see is not you, is not their frowns, is not their smiles, is not what I'm going to see when I'm with you is Jesus himself and what he's done for me. Now he may be ministering that viewpoint to them, but it's one that he actually possessed. This is what I'm going to see. And he was with them a year and a half. This is what I'm going to see when I'm with you. I, God is helping me more and more and more when I'm in this church, not to see this church, but to see him. You'd say, well, why is that important? It's very important for ministers because ambition subtly takes over. Uh, identity, value, all of those human things things can play a part in ministry. And the ability to be in a ministry that God puts you in and not see that ministry, but to see Jesus and him crucified, uh, that's a miracle. First, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2, we're talking about pursuing Jesus. It sounds Old Testament, doesn't it? Pursuing Jesus. What do you mean? He already got me. Wait. Uh, we'll explain that. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2, grace and peace be not added, multiplied to you. How many would like the grace that you know multiplied? Yes. Yes. Multiplied to you in, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. In that knowledge, in the, the sphere I had a couple weeks ago, the, inside the knowledge of God, grace and peace multiply. Outside the knowledge of God, there's no grace and peace. You need grace and peace? Don't chase grace and peace. Chase the knowledge of God. In there, it all multiplies. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I didn't turn this on. I'll still, I'm timing myself, sorry. There we go. I'll, I'll cut it. Go for it. I think I've two minutes so far. Three minutes? Uh, his power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That, that could mean just natural life, but it could mean the, the true life, what life is, and godliness through the knowledge of him. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory, and I, a couple weeks from now, I think I'm going to, we're going to talk about this word. Really unusual word, doxa in the Greek. And glory has to do with a good opinion, having a good opinion. But the reason there's a good opinion is because glory has to do with God. It, glory always has to do with God revealing himself. The revelation of who God is, eventually at the great white throne of judgment, where uh, that portion of humanity gets thrown into eternal judgment. Everybody's going to praise and glorify God. Amen. Because he, when he reveals himself, his beauty, his perfections, uh, all that makes God God 
He's glorified. When he shows who he is, people can't help but have a good opinion of him. Because there's nothing but beauty and glory coming out of him. So the idea of glory being splendor or radiance, it is. But what's being uh, shown is who he is. And who he is, is the radiance. It is the, the revelation of God. You can almost take the word glory and put revelation of God. The self-revelation of God is his glory and virtue. That Virtue just means all the good stuff. In other words, you were called by his radiating revelation of himself and all the beauty that came with that. You're called into him by that. Grace and peace are only found in the knowledge of God. Uh, I've shared this story before, but for me, uh, it's very uh, impactful right now, very dynamic, is uh, Ezekiel 16 talks about the baby raised, found in its blood, uh, God saves it, it lives. He, uh, as she grows up, he adorns her with all sorts of uh, raiment and beauty and jewelry. She prostitutes herself, takes her beauty, prostitutes herself. I don't know, I'll just speak for myself. Uh, I've had a few times, because I've always lived with the theory that Jesus is everything. He, of course I would die for him. I'm like Peter holding my sword up. Of course I'll die for you. Jesus is everything to me. There are a few times in my life where I think he really, really, really was. <laughs> um, and by that I mean where I could lose everything, and it wouldn't matter. I could lose everybody, and it wouldn't matter. If, if Jesus is, quote-unquote, everything to you, join Peter, and you mean well, you're sincere enough, but uh, when you start losing people or losing stuff, for him to be everything to you then is... And so, but when I looked at him that way, and he truly was. And it's a miracle for our hearts to get there, I think. Where he truly was everything to me. He began to bless and he began to uh, prosper me. He began to do things. He began to work through me in different ways. Uh, and without knowing it, in the middle of all the benefits that flowed out of him, uh, they became competitive for him in my heart. And before I knew it, I was caught up in all these beautiful things going on. And I lost him, my love for him in the process. It was compromised. Not aware of it till later. Now, I don't know. Usually when I try to share that with people, there's kind of like, okay. <laughs> and I'm not saying you, but I've shared with other ministers kind of like, okay. It, it could be either me or else we people that are known as ministers around the world have a real, have to know Jesus and, uh, and not get caught up in our ministries, whatever they are. So things we need to know about pursuing Jesus. Number one, you don't pursue him up and you don't pursue him out. You pursue him in. Uh, he's in heaven. You can look up and pray toward heaven depending on where, how the globe's spinning. No, I, I, have you ever wondered about that? Look up. What if that was 12 hours ago? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but you don't have to calm down in heaven. He already came. And you don't have to look out. You, the, the Jesus you're pursuing is in you. Well, why pursue him then? Uh, number two is not by works or merit. You pursue by faith. Uh, faith in Christ himself and faith in the Holy Spirit. If we took the uh, blood and oil, those two things from a couple few weeks ago, blood is confidence in Christ the provider. What, he, what we already have, it's not, that's not a process. That's an absolute finished work. So faith in Christ is faith in what I have. Faith in the blood. But then you need also faith in the oil. Faith in the Holy Spirit. 
Because what Jesus provides, the Holy Spirit applies. And we have the provision, we need to gain confidence that, okay, it's done, I can't add to that. You have it all. Can you say that with me? I have it all. all. You have it all. You can't get it, you got it. That being said, we need confidence in the one who applies it all. The one who helps us capitalize on what we already have. So what we have is not a process. But what gets applied is very definitely a process. What the Holy Spirit's up to. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Paul saying, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Chapter 3 verse 12. Not that I've already attained. Well, Paul hadn't. You know. Did Paul know him? Yes. Do you know him? Yes. But he said, I haven't attained. Haven't attained what? Or am already reached the consummate end product that I'm after here. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What's that goal? I want to know Him. Well, you know Him, Paul. No matter what stage Paul attained to in the process, no matter how far down his path he went. If he took his eyes and looked to the future as far as knowing Jesus, he had an infinite path still ahead of him. Why? See, for Paul, he wasn't confused about the finished work of Christ. He wasn't trying to make Jesus give him more than he had. Uh, For him, his relationship with God was once and for all, can't add anything to it, finished. But on the other hand, is capitalizing on that reality. Every Christian on the face of the earth right now has the same package. It's helping some a little. It's helping some not at all. Eternally, thank God they've got that. But uh, how do we capitalize on this thing? How do we take advantage of the opportunity we've been given? And that taking advantage of the finished work of Christ, is a lifelong, continual process with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the one we're getting to know that we already know, see, the Bible says that you all will all know me from the very least to the very greatest. He wants to make sure you don't exclude yourself. You know him. You already do. Well, why talk about knowing him? (laughs) Because he's infinite. He's big. Ten million years from now, I'm going to be going, I want to know him better. Why? Because infinite goes on for a while. Pursuing Jesus does not mean he's running away and you're trying to catch him. Your complete and total relationship with God's already purchased. It's built into the new covenant. You all know me. It's written there. So pursuing Jesus means capitalizing on, taking advantage of, not ignoring, not wasting, his open arms, his desire for communication and intimacy. Isn't that amazing? We're sitting here, we have affronted him, offended him. He has crossed that off through his own sacrifice and says, can we hug? You want to hug? We have a marriage covenant, and he's keeping his end of the bargain. Pursuing Jesus means paying attention to the Holy Spirit who promised never to leave or forsake us. While the Holy Spirit's been sitting patiently for 25 years waiting for the first conversation. Pursuing Jesus means not wasting the opportunity to know him better that he already bought us. So things about pursuing Jesus. Number one, it's Christ within, not out. Christ within. Number two, it's by faith in the provision and faith in the application 
by Christ, by the Holy Spirit. Number three, it doesn't take strength or willpower, thank God. Because my willpower and strength give out periodically. It takes submission, it takes yielding, it takes responsiveness. Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. You're not doing the standing, you're not doing the knocking. If anyone hears my voice, initiative's his, volition is his, and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. Aren't you glad that what Jesus wants to do in your life is eat with you? Well, God, we're going to, and we're going to, and we're going to, and we're going to. God says, sit down, let's eat. Let's spend some time over food. John 16, 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you. You've got a personal life coach. He will guide you into all truth. The word truth means what really is. Not what people think really is. What really is. You'd step off a six-story building ledge because you think the ground is right there, but it's fog you can't see. The fog is the world that, mo- that we live in. The concrete six stories below is truth. It's the reality. You hit that concrete, you've just found the truth. Uh, he will guide us into all truth, into all reality. We can't decide to love God more, want God more, give up everything for Jesus, and succeed at it. Have you, do you know that? Our job is to quit fighting, quit resisting, as the Holy Spirit leads us into these realities. How to love God more. How to want God more. How to follow Jesus in everything. See, we don't just decide to love and then love. Oh, God says love him? Okay. How do we do that? How uh, The Laodiceans can't do that, lukewarm. See, the hope, Laodicea provides so much comfort for me. Because it doesn't matter how lukewarm we are. He says, eat with me. You'll get to know me over food. You'll find out my love for you. And then you'll start loving me back. We don't decide our way into Christ's love. We grow our way into it over dinner. (laughs) Yeah. There's hope for all of us. Any Laodiceans out there that go, man, my heart, but uh, they kept telling me, repent, repent, I can't seem to change it. You can't change it. But the Holy Spirit will lead you into it. So it's Christ within. It's by faith in Christ's provision and the Holy Spirit's application. It doesn't take willpower, it takes submission. And uh, last point today is don't get too anxious. We're going, it's going to be a few minutes yet. Uh, bear with me here because it sounds wrong, but it's not. We don't get rid of flesh. Now this is a big one because I, you hear, I'm hearing teaching quite frequently going the other direction. And they're wrong, I'm right. There, we don't, for all you on the internet, that's joking, I'm joking. We don't get rid of flesh in order to fill up with spirit. That's backwards. Oh, God can't put anything in the cup until you empty the cup. How do I empty it until God puts something in it? We fill up with the spirit in order to overcome the flesh that has been binding and overcoming us. Jesus will relate to you while you're in your flesh pit. In fact, that's the only way anybody has ever gotten out of their flesh pit. The blood bought us the right to believe that he will relate to me in my fleshy condition. Now you've got to be, you've got to turn your focus and attention toward him.
But I'm saying that the fact that sins have owned you, controlled you, dominated your behavior, you can't seem to break this, can't seem to stop that, not a surprise to God. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And then he says, if you will simply begin to look at, respond to my Holy Spirit, I'm good at beating this stuff for you. And you're not going to beat it on your own. The whole idea that I have to get rid of my flesh to get close to Jesus doesn't even make sense. If we could, we wouldn't need the cross. They would have done it. Righteousness, by law, is get your behavior right and you'll have favor. Righteousness, by faith, is you get favor as a gift, you bad person, you. And that'll lead you into good behavior. Well, God doesn't care about good behavior. It's the only way you get it. Amen. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, not ours, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We need the grace before the good works so that the good works can come. Thank you, Charles. Law says lifestyle leads to favor, but when we believe that, our works get the credit. The credit goes to our behavior. Grace says favor received as a gift, undeserved, leads to lifestyle. When we believe that, Christ's work gets the credit, not ours. Internal fellowship with the Holy Spirit while we're under the control of the flesh is the only way possible to break the flesh's control. So don't say, don't try to say, you don't deserve, and you're bad, you do this, and you can say, true, 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 all true. At the same time, you can say, but the cross. It bought me a righteousness that allows me to have right standing with God in spite of all that. Turn into fellowship with the Holy Spirit that's there for you in the middle of your stuff, and he will walk you out, and he will guide you into all reality, all truth. There's a ticket to get on board the change train. And that's the cross and the Holy Spirit's fellowship. We can't change our lives without joining hands in fellowship with the Spirit. When you find His life inside of you, while you're buried in your stuff, you can change your life inside, but not before. It comes in fellowship. And when you change your life inside because you found his life inside, that's the seeking. Then you can change your life outside. But you don't start on the outside. Start in. The Spirit leads the way in clearing out the flesh. When, <laughs> when buried in the flesh, the blood bought your right to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Then, while still buried in the flesh, the spirit you begin to fellowship with will walk you right out of the flesh by his power, not by yours. Galatians 5.16, I, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't. Oh, I want to stop and I want to stop. Well, don't worry about stopping. Worry about walking in the Spirit. When you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Usually it's taught, stop fulfilling the lust of the flesh and you can walk in the Spirit. That's wrong. Romans 8, verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if, say it with me, by the Spirit. You put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. Who puts it to death? You do. It's your choice. How do you do it? By the Spirit. Isn't that awesome? Philippians 3 verse 10. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul got the order mixed up here because it should have been the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. But Paul knew, no, you need the power of the resurrection to handle the fellowship with his sufferings. Well, I don't want to follow Jesus because then I'm going to have to join in the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to tell you, that even if you don't have any of Christ's sufferings, if you're not walking the power of his resurrection, you've got a degraded lifestyle. The best life facing uh, uh, anybody is living on the face of the earth today is somebody who is living by the power of Christ's resurrection and fellowshipping with the sufferings of Christ. But they've got the better deal. I don't envy somebody without that and without suffering. If by any means I may atta- attain to the resurrection from the dead, not someday, now. Yeah. Ephesians 3, verse 14. In a few weeks, God willing, we're going to take this one prayer here and break it down in a service, but we'll get there. There's a lot in here. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of my Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory, Revelation, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Strengthened with might. Uh, The word strengthened is not, might is power, dunamis. Strengthened is kratos, which it's, it's a different word for strength, but it means arm wrestling strength. It means dominating strength. It means strength in combat that you'll be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart. God, the Bible says, sent the spirit into your heart. Spirit's in there. But the heart includes more than the spirit. The heart includes the soul. The mind, will, emotions, human personality. That Christ can come alive in your heart. That takes power. That takes the work of the Holy Spirit. Through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. A lot to be said there about all that. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And before you cross, that's not even possible, that's not impossible. The fullness of the Godhead lived in Christ and now we have been made complete in him. So, well, someday uh, the fullness of God is already in your spirit. Now he wants to get it into your heart. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. Now I've always thought that meant working miracles, raising the dead, more millions being saved, and and it could include all that. But in context, if you just kind of look back at the last verse, in context, how much, how well can I know Jesus? Infinite journey. How far can I get down the road? See, this is not just a challenge from God. This is a double dare. I dare you. Try me at this. God's saying, I want this. You think you want to know me? Where'd that desire come from? I want you to know me. And somebody's going to begin to believe. And it's beyond what you ask or could even think. Your potential in knowing Jesus himself is unlimited. There's no limit. There's no limit. Well, I think I know him pretty well. You're in trouble once you get there. I don't care what you know of God right now, forgetting all that's behind, whatever. What is it that lies ahead? Jesus. Knowing Jesus better. I'm pushing toward that. What's all this have to do with pursuing Jesus? (laughs) You don't have to You don't have to first become something you aren't in order to become it. Eventually. You don't have to become it 
in order to eventually become it. You don't have to first know Jesus any better than you already do in order to know him better eventually. In other words, the Holy Spirit will take you from exactly at the point you are in your journey and lead you to the place you could never possibly get to. It's the only way anybody gets there. All you have to do is live in the scriptures. Right, Charles? Live in the scriptures. Well, can I, I tell you there's a lie. Oh, I'm almost done. There's a lie that, uh, you know, aside from Satan accusing you and telling you what a sinner you are, that, there's another lie. And that is, I'm just not a word person. I'm just, I'm just not a reader. I'm just not a reader. I'm just, I'm just, I'm more of a Holy Spirit, not a scripture. I'm kind of a, on the Holy Spirit end of things, you know. I want to tell you, you're as far in the Holy Spirit as you are in scripture. And you're as far in the scripture as you are in the Holy Spirit. We were talking about this just in pre-service prayer. God isn't a relationship machine that you pull these three levers and push these five buttons, say the right password, and you get in. God isn't that. What's it mean when God says, I want relationship with you? See, God knows who he's relating to. God knows how to relate to you. He, he's not just saying, push the lever and push the button. He's saying, we're going to relate. In other words, whatever you do with Scripture or not, God is well able to navigate and manage relationship with you. Angel and Max are getting married here soon. That, that, that being the case, we can think we know them, but there is something chemistry-wise, chemical-wise, that is developing between them that is more unique than fingerprints. It's, it's the packaging. It's how the bonding. It's the kind of bond that occurs. God is not trying to make you something that you aren't. God knows how to develop his relationship with you in the way he can have it with you, in the way that you can have it with him, that is totally unique to who you are. So take the scriptures and quit letting Satan talk you out of being a scripture person. Claim them. Own them. Call them your own. Make them your life partner. And while you're doing that fellowship with the Holy Spirit, talk to the Holy Spirit. Be aware he's talking to you. He doesn't stop chatting. He doesn't stop. He's 24-7. He's talking right now. Communicate and pray in the Spirit a lot. So pursuing Jesus, Christ within, faith in the blood, faith in the oil, the provision, the application. It doesn't take your strength or willpower. It takes submission, yielding, responsiveness. And number four, the Spirit leads you out of the flesh. Next Sunday's topic, pursuing Christ, part two. Okay? Let's, amen. Amen.